<clears throat> Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to today's poetry reading and an interactive literary talk with some phenomenal poets of this time. So many, many thanks who have already joined. As you know, this uh, series has been planned to stay in association with you while you are self-isolating. And I'm sure this is helping you uh, and uh, um, helping you to find a bit of solace, uh, focusing on something really meaningful, something that can, that can give you a ventilation, redemption, people who already uh, are admired of arts, literature, music. Many thanks to them. They're finding it quite helpful, beneficial, and then they're leaving so many wonderful feedbacks. And then that inspires us to do more and more. And that inspires us to feature many world-class musicians, poets, dancers, uh, artists from every sphere uh, of art form. Uh, Gronti is delighted to feature three wonderful poets of this time now. Uh, uh, those who are familiar with the Gronti, uh, they perhaps are aware that it promotes global literature, world literature, uh, through festivals, events, um, you know, sessions of talk. Uh, and uh, also, uh, although it predominantly focuses on new voices, experimental literature uh, from South Asian uh, background and uh, any other global background from global culture, many different diverse culture. It hosts mainly an international poetry festival and that was supposed to take place this year in Oxford University in September, but uh, unfortunately for this situation, with this situation, I don't think it, it would be, it will be possible to organize this festival uh, as we have planned before, but uh, definitely we'll do something in some form, in some shape, uh, and we'll continue uh, preaching the great art history of poetry great art history uh, of global literature uh, very soon when when lockdown is over and uh, the intimidation that corona is spreading will be is over so many many thanks who have joined a uh, and uh, this is live this is going live from let me perhaps uh, uh, share before i'm asking everyone to share uh, I am going to, this will be available in my page very soon now. Uh, no, 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 great, sorry. So that's available in my page, uh, my profile page. So anyone who are watching, please do share, and especially our um, uh, poets who have joined today, they can share from my page now. This is available in my page. Uh, this is going live, streaming live from my page. You can share and the audiences uh, who are watching, you can help us uh, by sharing, first of all, connecting as many audiences as possible. And also uh, you are helping your friends uh, by giving them an opportunity to listen, to discover, uh, to explore the art history of three wonderful poets of this time. So please do share and many, many thanks. I'm just going to uh, introduce uh, the uh, panel members and the poets today. 
I'm delighted to uh, introduce the editor of the Granthi and the poet, uh, Shamim Shahan. Many, many, many thanks uh, for joining and welcome to today's session. Thank you so much, uh, uh, poet Kaiser and today's panel member, uh, poets. Many thanks for joining and many thanks for just which you're watching for today's Granthi's session. Hopefully you are enjoying everyone. Thank you so much, Kaiser. Many thanks, uh, Shamim Shahan. Uh, we have a wonderful poet who, have, uh, who has joined from Bradford, uh, Musarat Rahman. Uh, many, many thanks for joining Musarat and welcome to today's, uh, today's uh, session. Uh, thank you for inviting me. It's nice to be here. Uh, I'm very pleased that you've uh, asked me to join actually. It's very nice. Many thanks, Musarat. Uh, Musarat is a practicing South Asian artist born in the UK, but her family originated from Srinagar, Kashmir, India. Experimenting across medium, particularly visual arts, practicing across the board of creative arts, I managed to watch some of, some of your beautiful artworks, including using reclaiming materials. Musarat has been a participant, participating artist at least 20 years, an initial, sorry, practicing artist at least 20 years, and initially started off as textile student and gradually expanded on her delivery of the art literature spectrum. Art literature spectrum becoming self-taught. She's a volunteer and a lead member of Bison, a refugee and asylum support group in Bradford, and continues to support the group by various activities and others. We will discover uh, something more uh, through talk soon. I'm also delighted to feature again as part of the series, a wonderful poet and a wonderful friend of mine, uh, Shivan McMahon. Uh, many thanks for joining Shivan and welcome to today's Session. Thank you. It's an absolute pleasure to be part of these inspiring uh, series of poets from all over the world. So thank you. Mm. Many thanks. Uh, Shivan, as you know, Shivan is an Irish poet, a performance poet who has been creating spoken word projects for many, many years, combining poetry with music, dance, and with film. Uh, her work speaks of the return of the sacred famine sacred feminine and our deep connection to the art, to the earth. Winner of Woman at Open Mic 2017, shortlisted for the Hennessy Poet Poetry Award 2018, published online and in print, including Skylight 47, The Irish Times, and The Hallelujah for 50 Foot Woman, and the Blood X Anthology. I am also very honored to, uh, to have, to be able to feature one of the finest point poets of Uruguay, who has just joined from Uruguay now, uh, Roberto Echa Barren. Uh, many thanks Roberto for joining uh, from Uruguay and welcome to today's uh, session. Hello, thank you very much for inviting me. This is going to be fun, I hope. <laughs> <laughs> so Roberto is, a Uruguayan, is an Uruguayan poet and translator. Uh, he has many works published. Uh, he's an academician as well. He uh, visited so many countries, so many universities, uh, and so many poetry books has been published uh, recognized by many prestigious uh, authorities. La Pinacle Mojada, which is 1981 uh, poetry anthology published, uh, published in 1981. Uh, Animalas Animalasio, 1986. Uh, many, many poetry books, and uh, you know, I just, I was just reading your some of your works in uh, uh, Wikipedia, Roberto. 
Um, that was really, really amazing. Amazing work. So many thanks for joining as part of the series. Let us start with poetry reading. Let us come back to Shivan now. Uh, Shivan, uh, can we start? Uh, did you find the uh, Did you find the live streaming okay? Yes, yes, I've shared it. Yeah. Okay, great. So, Musara, did you find live streaming? Uh, I okay. I will I'll have to do it when we when we get a little bit of a quiet time. So I'm not okay. disrupting. Uh, so Shivan, uh, I I would like to come back. I would like to ask you some questions actually, uh, because we would like to you know this idea is to have interactive talk. Uh, but let us start with uh, a bit of uh, poetry reading. Okay. Well, it, I, I, I today I'm I'm feeling quite. Um, it seems important about all the voices that are not heard in our society, and mm. it feels important that we have a new story. Um, so this is about this is a, this is a tiny one. It's a series of poems called Fragments, and they're kind of like lost bits. So this is a series. This is number one, fragment one. Mm. One day, a voice spoke to me in the language of silence. My body answered and I was undone. Return to the land of your belonging, it said. Dig up the bones of your ancestors. Follow the old dreaming paths. Your voice has been buried in a sarcophagus of soil and silence, but there is a new story and it is time for it to be told. So I'm going to do, um, I'll just do three, I think, to start off with. That would that be? Would that oh, be? Yeah. Good, do you think? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. This, one, this one is called "False Gods," and again, it's about a different story, and it's about the silencing of voices in our mm -hmm. world. Mm -hmm. False gods. If we clutter up our lives with the relentless, noisy clamor of consumer must have false god goods, how will we hear the silent sacred breathing through us? And if we clog up our skies with our polluted ways, tearing great holes in the skirts of heaven, how will our babies breathe? And if we fell our mighty trees, chopping off their limbs, severing our connection, how will we hear the singing of the birds in their ancient wing, in their ancient arms, and who will hold the roots of our belonging? And if we send our men out to war, arming them with our inflammatory hatred, trampling our vicious boots through the holy temple of another man's God, who will father our children and teach them about love? And if we rape our women, shaming the wild beauty of their souls, who will hold our trembling bodies in the darkness of the night and lead us into bliss? And if we lame our dancers, blind our seers, silence our poets, silencing their ragged songs and imprisoning their ecstasy, who will remember the way back home? Who will remember the way back home? And I'm going to just do um, one more uh, now, I think. And it's, this is a brand new one, so it's probably not even finished, but mm, it... Um, no. I'm going to try it out, sure, and it's, so I'll have to read this one really more. Um, it's probably not finished, but it's called, it's called Stepping Off the Path. Sometimes you are called to step out onto an invisible path, a path you have no map for, except the one you carry scrolled in your body, the one you brought back from the forsaken lands of the dead with your name written on it in indelible ink. There will be no going back. The path behind you, the one you have walked for thousands of years, is already overgrown, the way littered with burning bridges. Many will say you are mad. They will be furious with you. They will demand you turn back, insist you explain your reasoning. Say nothing to them. For how could you translate the exquisite music of God into words? Thank you. Oh, beautiful, Shivan. Oh, Thank you. Thank you. Um, one thing that I I always uh, feel um, I always in a position to ask you actually uh, because you said you 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 were in the process of writing how this process of writing poetry uh, works for you. I mean, did you plan? 
the theme uh, before you write or just, you know, it comes to you as an oracle? Almost oh, like as an oracle. I think, oh. yes. I think what happens for me is I, I can't just sit down and say I'm going to write a poem. No, it's like I, I might be washing the dishes or walking the dog in the woods or doing something other. And mm. suddenly there'll be a moment and I'll go, oh, my God. And I, have, and I get a line or a some, uh, maybe a couple of lines. And then I have to just put them down on the page and leave them, not question them, not edit them, just leave them be for at least a day before I look at them again. And then I look at it and it's like, oh, there's the beginning of something. And then I kind of start um, fashioning it a little bit, but I, I've, I've learned, I think if, if anything over the last 20 years, I've learned to be gentle with them mm -hmm. and um, you know, to try and keep the critical mind out and to see what's there because of, often it isn't quite obvious what's there yet. And I have to kind of, feel away and then I might do one draft and then I leave it and sometimes I leave poems for weeks and months and even years and then what I'll go back and I'll time? go oh. what is the longest time you leave a uh, poet for I mean for you to edit perhaps I mean after two two or three years did that happen to you two or three after yes. two or three years you found oh this is uh, uh, you know an unedited, unedited uh, line to left perhaps for two or three years and then and then uh, you see, and then you see it and I think for me, the poems are always, um, they're always wiser than I am. <laughs> and so I sometimes have to catch up with them before I can finish writing them. Yeah. yeah. And then, uh, how, how often do you edit? Does it happen to you uh, in a way that sometimes you, you uh, discover, even the, the poem has been published in, in a book even, and then you think, oh, this word, I can, let, let me edit this word. Or, you know, does this editing uh, happen quite constantly in you? Or just you, once you wrote it, that's fine now? No, it's never final. I think, um, I think then when I, when I actually speak it out loud for the first time and then, and then perform it a few times and then you realize that you've left this word out or you've changed mm -hmm. this around and you think, oh, and you realize it, it, it's the performing of it that sometimes edits, mm -hmm. edits it's it. And then, yeah, and then, mm -hmm. then I think just sometimes you just have to, you're never going to be able to express exactly, exactly what you want, very seldom. So then you write another poem and constantly trying to kind of capture something invisible that is very hard to capture in words. So yeah, always editing, always. Exactly. And also, especially a person like you, you are so close to music as well. So uh, the one, the poet who has a kind of a journey, you, you uh, collaborated with music and even film. So perhaps editing uh, is, I, I assume, a constant process for you, perhaps you. you yes, it's, it's, it's like I have a poem called Unfinished Symphony and I think <laughs> it's always, I think it's like the universe, isn't it? It's, it's an unfinished mm -hmm. symphony and we're all just trying to write our little bit of it or sing our bit of it maybe. Yeah. Sure. Uh, let's come back to Musarat. Uh, uh, Rahman uh, ladies and gentlemen who are watching please do share uh, if you find it interesting I'm sure your friends will find the same please do share and let others be the part of this uh, poetry beautiful poetry session uh, by a few wonderful poets of this time hello Mr. Rath, how are you hi I'm all right thank you <laughs> how are you coping with this unprecedented time that's how i should describe well it's, it's very challenging i'll be honest because not being able to go out and meet friends and just talking to them by a phone and just whatsapp is is a bit challenging you know so that's been the biggest thing for me i've still been in touch with my family because we live quite relatively very close like two doors away so i still see the children and obviously my parents don't live in the same in bradford but we still try and keep in touch with each other so that's it's it's had its ups and down moments, is the right word. Yes, are you um, just as, you say, as an artist? Are you, uh, as an artist, are you quite a face-to-face -face interactive uh, person, or just prefer? Well, I was. Prefer I was in your own cave. Oh, well, actually, 
I was quite lucky because the Bradford Council were giving out some grants, response grants in, in response to everybody losing the works. I, I managed to be successful in a little grant and I, what I created was artwork in response to COVID to an ap apocalyptic world. So I did it as, a, as um, combining elements of different themes of nature, funk, spirituality and different elements and creating garments and headwear, footwear, facewear, loads of different things. So I had, I've had some fun creating on, on that side, to be honest. It's been quite quite good. <laughs> okay. Oh, great, Mr. Rick. Let us uh, listen to your reading, uh, perhaps two or three at a time, and then I'll come back to you again. Okay. Well, the first, this one is a new one. This is, um, I wrote this in response to um, looking at what's happening with marginalizing communities, because I work a lot with refugees and sound seekers, and I do delve a lot in migration movement. So this is what, this one's called Grandad. Grandad. My granddad was the first to arrive, to leave his homeland and serve in a foreign land. The same country which depleted my ancestral links. The same country which uprooted a whole civilization in the name of freedom. Creating a monster while the survivors are still living its legacy. I am the third generation of the firstborn Daisies in the UK, still fighting for a nation's survival, regardless of ethnicity. I know I'm still a child of a migration culture, still bound by invisible rules and regulations, not marked out for the general populace, unless you sell your soul, forgo your roots and uphold Britishness. Britishness made on the backs of immigrants, migrants and change makers, those seeking a better destiny when called to a new land, a new world. Where seekers of adventures, explorers of new worlds arrived, seemed possible beyond their wildest dreams until the bitterness of a na racist nation hit, crippled by its own illusions and feardom, gripped many by its snarly smile and baring teeth, exposing those seeking a better life to an unwelcomed welcome. So the second one I've wrote is called Destination. I am a weary traveller, moving trudgingly, dragging my feet along the path. The path leads onwards, with no destination in sight. I haven't lost my fight. The weariness is in sight, biting my bones raw and deep. I have no tears to weep. They are made from salt and dust, collected along the road, as I have traversed miles upon miles to reach this point, where I will not turn or break. I am steadfast and strong. A will of iron is inside me. I just need to rest and rejuvenate and I will reclaim my sovereignty to stand tall and proud again, reaching a place to call home. And the last one is a small one. It's a, a short one. And this is called the Mighty Oak. Hmm. The light and dark go hand in hand, moving, breathing, exhaling and more. Give the divine space to grow. And from a seed, a mighty oak will grow into a tree of knowledge, of wisdom, of truth, and at the heart of it, it is you. The depth, the reality that shapes the branches and grows leaves. Each leaf is a new skill, new thought, dream and desire that the heart and mind have grown together, budding, grown and then shedding into a new branch signaling a change of direction, inspiring change once maturity has been reached, signaling that the once little seed is now a majestic mighty oak. That's mm. it. Thank you, Mr. You're very, very, very direct. And uh, um, while I was listening to uh, your poetry, uh, I because obviously you worked in uh, other medium, other art media. So uh, how the uh, writing process works for you? Say, for instance, if you come up with theme, uh, any theme. Uh, how do you decide that uh, you know you either you should write either you should express through poetry or through art form? Uh, does it always a struggle for you? Is it always a struggle for you, or just you? When any theme comes, it comes with uh, the media you want to express as well. I think it was a struggle, of, to be honest, because I concentrated mainly on my art, but I combined it within my art, but not. I couldn't say it verbally, I suppose. I expressed it through my art most of the time. But then I got to a point where I was writing, but I hid it. I was a closet poet, really. And I wrote a lot about 
spiritual things, I suppose, and life in general, I suppose, with the things that I was, in the community that I'm working with and the things I was seeing, I was trying to find ways to express it. Um, mm -hmm. Sometimes I find that art can be more direct, I suppose, because you can do more with art, I suppose. In the, in the, when I was working in the medium of art, I find I can totally change it. Mm -hmm. But then when I came back to my writing, because I used to write when I was younger and then I stopped, came back to it, I stopped. It just comes, I suppose, in floods. So I have to write it as I see it. And then I, I take a step back because I need to think about what I've done, you know, in a sense to process it. So it's a bit of a journey, I suppose, both with writing and both with the art. And I'm trying, I found, I have found it very challenging to mix both. And I was, wasn't sure if I, it's only, only for extreme. Do you, do you find any exchange between uh, two different art forms that you, that you... Uh... If you saw my latest work, it is, yeah. it is an exchange between words and art. It's more abstract and more expressive. It's actually in my living room, but when I get a chance, I'll show you. But it was, it was a bit challenging because I'd never met anybody who was combining um, art with poetry until a friend of mine introduced me to someone. And I thought, that's the only person I've met so far who is combining arts and poetry. So that was a relief for me, thinking. I was I was a little bit confused at first, to be honest. Mm, yeah. Siobhan may like her as well, because Siobhan is working on, uh, as far as I can remember, Siobhan was working on uh, pushing the boundary of poetry. She, uh, she tries to merge uh, poetry with music, so that, uh, and then in, some, in different languages, different words, not just uh, English or Irish. So she, tries to translate some sort of themes in different um, languages. We'll try to find and discover a bit more on this. Let us uh, go back to Roberto Echavarri. Hello, Roberto, how are you? Hi, hi, thank you. So those who are not familiar with uh, Roberto, he's one of the finest Uruguayan poets. Uh, and um, we are extremely delighted to to be able to feature him as part of the series uh, today. Thank you. Thank you. So, Roberto, we would like to listen to you first, and then we'll, we'll talk. Uh, especially Uruguayan poetry. I mean, Latin American poetry and literature is so popular all around the globe. Uh, especially magic realism, post-boom literature is is so close to uh, many poets uh, in different parts of the globe. Uh, and that's why perhaps most of the authors, writers, Pablo Neruda, for an example, and many, many, I, should, I shouldn't mention the name actually. So uh, even uh, I am, I'm a big fan, I always say I'm a big fan of Borjas, uh, who hello is Borjas. Uh, and uh, so Latin American literature as a whole is the center of world's attention uh, even till now. But when it comes to Uruguayan poetry, uh, I can remember I read uh, some uh, beautiful verses of uh, a great poet uh, of 20th or 19th century, perhaps, uh, Julio Hanera Raising. Uh, yeah. uh, I would like to uh, know a bit more from you about him, but let us start with your uh, poetry. Okay. I'm going to read three fragments of a longer poem, which Great. in English translation, the book is called The Virgin Mountain. Each one is an island universe where it all happens, storms and rivers, water spouts and jets, the song of meteors, each has its own world its rivalries and honors rolled in a spiral, turbulent and wild. Cyclones escape everywhere, sea flaps shaking up. Each turbulence brings suffering and danger. Doesn't matter how small the gradual uprising of the wheel at each turn produces a spiral, a horse tail of fluxes dismemberment and destruction.
pines and eucalyptus slide down the hill toward the hotel, a massive of pressure exerted by light. It's the fact and the infinitive also. It happens in the present and in the time of the eon that always was for how could being not be? This declaration of an indefinite process the intimacy of silence went reverberating. The note doesn't stop. It inhabits us completely. It was always here, even when we, even when we were not. The wind rubs it in and nothing more is heard. This wild crudeness leaves us out in the open among piles of removed earth and plant roots up in the air. I stuck out into the crude orb, the chemical spirit of vibrations. I stuck out into the crude orb that isn't an orb anymore. This unity of a perception suddenly doesn't know who gave it such crudeness to itself? This empty house, this waste terrain, it's a perception mercurial of crudeness deprived of world, hyperventilated breathing of a skinless jaw. I guess, I don't know if you understood crudeness, but I suppose it's rawness, not to be raw. <laughs> It's quite nice, actually. Okay. And um, before it wasn't like that, it seemed that everything would stand firm. The jar of honey was immortal, the door paint, the house, the shoes, clothes, cars. But to the Looks like Roberto is frozen. Hello, Roberto. And uh, let us read some uh, audience's feedback in the meantime. Uh, Gaby Sambucity, an Argentine poet who is watching. Uh, many thanks, Gaby, for watching. Uh, and you said you, you wrote, great to see you all and great to know you were there. And uh, Diane Shilito says, beautiful. Many thanks for watching. Uh, Susanna Palazzuti, Palazzuti uh, said, thanks, Shivon, uh, and thanks uh, from us as well to Shivon for reading beautiful poem. Has Shivon read it? Uh, Diane Shilito wrote. Uh, uh, yes, she did, but she will do it again. So nice of you indeed. Uh, Jewel Mazhar, a poet from, uh, a poet from Bangladesh wrote, uh, so nice of you indeed. Many, many thanks, uh, Joel Mazhar, for watching. Uh, perhaps we'll have you uh, uh, one, want to feature you one day as part of the series. Uh, I'm personally familiar with your uh, poetry, powerful poetry, I should say. Um, and he wrote, enjoying poetical moments with poets. Nice experience. Many thanks. Shonjoy Dev, a, a singer. A Tago singer, phenomenal Tago singer wrote, fabulous, all the best. Many, many thanks. Shomona Dashgupta, a poet from India, from Kolkata, said, the last one uh, is the best. And that's to uh, uh, Shivon. Uh, many thanks, Shomona, for watching. Uh, Popi Shahnaz wrote, watching. Many, many thanks, Popi Shahnaz. Uh, for watching. Uh, a, a humble request again, if you kindly share and let others uh, having uh, the same opportunity to, to be the part of this series. Uh, let me come back to you, Shivan, while I think 
and Roberto is Roberto Roberto's internet wasn't working and perhaps he has been thrown out. So let me come back to you again. Mm -hmm. uh, so you uh, you uh, I mean write you wrote so many traditional poetry uh, and good thing that I, I should I should declare as well you are the one who I'm not sure whether you you managed to go to Simasini. That's why I'm not sure, Shivan. Every time I try to introduce you, Simasini comes to my mind. Somehow you were connected to Simasini. Is that because of influence? I'm not sure, or is that because you met him uh, uh, one day or uh, in a? To, sorry, to to who, Kaiser? Simasini. Oh, chef! No, 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 no. I only, I only went to see him once, and no, and I've never. I didn't okay. know him. No, beautiful poet. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Oh. And uh, uh, you worked uh, with different art forms uh, just to popularize poetry. Uh, you, you try to merge poetry uh, with music, and that develops a better communication and expand the audience's network. And then again. Uh, uh, poetry and film. So many experiments you did, you performed in many festivals as a performance poet as well. Uh, one thing that I, I always uh, um, feel uh, to ask poets around me, uh, remember we, we used to have so many groundbreaking pieces of works uh, while group, uh, idea of group literature existed in Europe. Say, for instance, group, group 87, or ideal movement, uh, surrealism, imagism, uh, many different ism uh, developed. There are some certain negative things, perhaps, with this ism and movement. But also this, this contributed to world literature so hugely. They, they, that gave so many groundbreaking pieces of work. Uh, would you think we are, uh, I mean, that level of powerful, artwork or poetry or literature, I feel is absent in world literature now. Is that because of uh, uh, the, uh, that kind of movement is not happening anymore? If you oh. think about it, my separate magic realism, uh, I was trying to ask uh, Roberto about it, how it influenced Uruguayan literature uh, and, and many other movements that shaped actually world's literature in many different, not just literature, art in general, in different ways. Uh, so why this is this lack of movement uh, in, in, in the whole global scene? Is it because we don't need any movement? Uh, people are lonely, poets are, poets journey is so lonely that don't need to be in association with other poets and develop any idea of group literature or group uh, philosophy. Gosh, well, uh, that's a big question, isn't it? But I, I, I don't know, I think maybe we'll look back on this time and we will realise that actually um, poetry became, kind of came out of the rarefied fields of kind of high literature. I'm not saying high literature isn't wonderful, but um, and, and that there are so many people all over the world who are finding their voices and are expressing them in a different way. And there's so much performance poetry going on around the world and people mm. being very passionate. And I think poetry is the one of the forms of art that really expresses truth. And mm. Um, so I think actually poetry is enormously powerful. I mean, I'm, I, I know you know um, the Hundred Thousand Poets for Change that I'm a member of that, and you know they've done extraordinary stuff all over the world. People are involved in that and have been. It's the tenth year anniversary this year, so mm. um, we've been we've been meeting online and talking about that, um, and um, we're going to ho hopefully be bringing out a book about the movement. So I think um there are huge movements of people and poetry and and speech and so i think maybe we'll look back and see that it's come out of the um white rarefied academia and mm -hmm. moved into something much more vibrant and positive mm -hmm. perhaps perhaps that's mm -hmm. how we'll look back mm -hmm. uh, let's say uh, let us listen a bit of poetry from you perhaps okay Right, I'm going to do, I'll do another three poems and, and just to say I'm not in, a, I've, I've rearranged my schedule so I don't have to 
to rush off, okay. so I'm able thank to you. stay and listen to everyone, which is lovely. Okay, so I'm going to do one. This is called Advice for My Daughter. Um, you've probably heard this um, before, but um, mm -hmm. it seems important. Advice for my daughter. They will try to keep you small. They will warn you about the dangers of being too loud, too clever, too wise, too ambitious, too much. They will mutter words darkly under their breath, such as strident and over-emotional, hormonal and oversensitive. They will threaten you with ancient memories of asylums and burnings. They will issue dire warnings about upsetting the apple cart, about dressing like a tart. Do not <laughs> listen to them. Do not break, break all their rules. Ignore them. Don't play by their rules. You'll never win. Make up your own rules. Tip the whole cart over and make cider from its sweet juices. Throw a wild party. Invite your sisters and your brothers. Put your red dress on and dance until dawn on the dying embers of the patriarchy. Speak your beautiful mind. Flaunt your wild wisdom. Be a brazen hussy with the truth that you know encoded in your DNA. Hear generations of women rising from their forgotten graves applauding you, clapping their bony fingers in delight. Go on, girl, get up on your high horse. You'll have a magnificent view from there. And that's one, is that one? Um, and I'm going to do another one. It's a little bit of fun. This We have a lot of, as I, I don't know if you can see, but behind me, I, um, I was in India for the first time ever earlier in this year it was a real wow when did you go she oh you I, it's been a it's been a desire of mine to go to india for about yeah. 10 10 15 years and i finally got there um at the end of february and and literally got there and got back just just before we got locked down and it was just an incredible oh, experience oh i loved it i loved it i loved it <laughs> and um so this is lakshmi i have lakshmi here behind me who i brought back and and of course ganesh as well and i have uh, bridget and mary and anyway all the goddesses but we also as well as there are extraordinarily wonderful goddesses in india and uh, we also have our own goddesses in ireland and they're quite feisty um women and uh so this is one a little bit of fun it's about one of the uh, about the irish goddesses and as everybody knows it's a bit can be a bit rainy and wet in ireland so this is the irish goddesses plan a holiday and i'm sure everybody knows but sappho who is mentioned here she's um a poet from ancient times um, uh, from uh, Greece and she wrote a lot about kind of um, yeah uh, sort of our deep connection to the earth and then sort of the erotic sensual connections this is about that so it's called the Irish goddesses plan a holiday we love this island of our birth of course we do but sometimes the wet weather gets us down we get sick of hunkering under the relentless purgatory of grey drizzle, our legs knee deep in bog and soil and sin. And we long to shrug off the nettle mantle of our mothers, join our sisters in land smelling of myrtle and honey, rose hips and lust. We long to slather our bone white bodies in oil pounded under Sappho's feet. Turn nutmeg brown. Let sweet air breathe on naked flesh. Let the purple blossom have its way. Let sea, let wind, let eros lead us all astray. <laughs> That's a little bit of fun for the Irish goddesses. And I'll finish up with this one. And this is, it's, it's a little bit different <clears throat> to a lot of poems I, I write, but um, I just have a... I did a master's in, in, in Dublin recently, in, a few couple of years ago in creative writing. This is one that came from that. And it's about my, I'm missing Ireland and Dublin at the moment. Um, I mean, I, I've been living in England 35 years. It's my home now too. But um, I'm also missing my family in Ireland because I can't go there at the moment. So I thought I'd, I'd, I'd read this one. And it's about my grandfather um, who used to, uh, lived in Dublin and used to get on his little bike and cycle up into the Wicklow Mountains every summer. And he would cut turf um, and he would camp out there and then you leave, you do it slowly over the summer and then you leave it to dry and then you pick it up in the autumn. So it, it's, it's called Cutting, Cutting Turf. So I'll read this one called Cutting Turf. The bone woman is singing out on the bog where my grandfather would cycle each summer from the city on his old black bike to pitch his small canvas tent, digging all day in the dark wet skirts of the bog, 
his slain slicing through millions of years of decay. His hands, more used to an artist's brush, stacking the wet sods in neat pyramids to drive. Later, hunkering over a smoky fire, the sweet smell of his pipe drifting over the heather, lapwings and curlews dipping and swooping, the day barely darkening at all. He would eat the sandwiches my grandmother had made, thick brown bread, home cooked ham, and taking the wooden beads polished by prayers from the pocket of his coat, he would kneel on the earth to pray. Thank you. Many, many, many thanks, Shivam. Uh, I know you mentioned a bit, but is it possible to uh, talk a bit more on some of your groundbreaking projects that expands actually the uh, boundary of uh, poetry? Uh, boundary of poetry, I mean, sort of the audience's network, from audience's point of view, you try to merge and uh, one of the projects that I worked with, that was also a phenomenon, you, you try to glorify and promote the beauty of different uh, languages. Uh, so is it possible to talk a bit more on this? For our yes, um, that was, yeah, I mean, I think for me, I, I always hate when a literature is in some sort of rarefied uh, place where it feels like as if it's only for an elite people, because to me, um, poetry is about connection and it's about um, it's about truth and it's about our belonging on the earth. And so that particular project um, that you were involved with, was, which is a, such a pleasure to do, it was um, a forgotten memory. It was a poem about our deep belonging to the earth and our grieving. Um, for what we've done to the earth and um, it was such a pleasure because so many people including yourself um, agreed to come along and we made a short film of it and, every, and everybody translated a bit of the poem into their own language and then we had this chorus because we all live on this beautiful planet and we don't need to be in conflict do we we need to be in harmony with all our gorgeous and beautiful and different voices and we need a harmony like nature is a harmony so that was a real pleasure to do so to me i think maybe because um my experience of of um being irish and living in england for such a long time i'm i'm never quite belong here and then i never quite belong when i go back to ireland either so i'm kind of in between and maybe that's why I particularly enjoy working with um, all sorts of different voices because mm. I think I'm nearly happier without people out a little bit outside, you know, and um, perhaps we, perhaps if you're a little bit outside, you can maybe see a little bit better and not get kind of so stuck with something, with one way of being. So to me, working together and collaborating with other, with other poets and artists and musicians is just a, a joy. I, I love it. Mm. Yeah, mm. it takes it out of the ego as well, doesn't it? Because you, 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 you're one person st does something and somebody else kind of goes, oh, we could do this and, and off you go. And it, it creates something much more than the part. So I, I love that, yeah. And I also remember you, you uh, gave your own inspiration in poetry uh, to mm. interpret some of the Indian ragas. Uh, and that's what I, what I did as part of show the a shoulders event in South Bank Centre, in Seven Arts Centre. And then that matches, that matched uh, with the mood of Raga so well. Uh, many thanks for your great contribution to uh, those uh, beautiful, beautiful events that you did. Uh, well, thank uh, you, because it was a it was a real pleasure, and it was an introduction to me to to, to a whole music I didn't know, and uh, such a spiritual music as well. So it was wonderful. Uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you, Shivan. Uh, you vaguely, you just vaguely mentioned that is also my interest. If you just, uh, uh, I I was interested in to explore your own interpretation of the truth. You mentioned the word truth, and then that also. Uh, it inspires me to ask you about your own interpretation of truth as a poet. How do you see uh, the paradigm of truth? Perhaps this is a long, <laughs> very long question, but I'll come back to you if you just structure it in your own way. Uh, let us uh, go back to uh, Musarat Rahman. But in the meantime, I would like to read some uh, wonderful uh, feedback, wonderful 
feedback by our uh, audiences who are watching. Uh, let me find out who wrote what. Uh, so, many, many thanks actually. Um, so it looks like even a session of poetry can be so popular, people can listen. Uh, I mean, poetry is always such a subtle form of art. Uh, it can't be, it's, I mean, it's hard to compare with even popular art forms. Uh, but uh, it's nice to see that people all around the globe are watching, many, many audiences are watching and uh, leaving some feedback. Uh, Joel Mazhar from Bangladesh uh, wrote, Seamus is my love. What a wonderful poet he was, won the hearts of millions around the globe. Uh, traditory uh, poetry doesn't, uh, it, that perhaps connects to Roberto. We can't still, uh, we couldn't still manage to uh, connect Roberto yet. Uh, so poetry doesn't allow to be translated. Uh, poets present here can focus on this. I myself being a traitor, yes, uh, yes you are. Uh, you have translated, uh, as far as I know, uh, many, many poems uh, from different culture, different languages, a translator. Uh, Gaby, who, who shared this link, I'm watching, great to see you all, um, watching and enjoying. So many, many comments, many thanks uh, for these beautiful comments. Musarat, um, Please start with uh, some poetry. And is it possible to see your uh, uh, some of your artworks? Yeah, I will bring some over. I will okay. read you some poetry and then I'll bring some out. Okay, great, great. I, I, I do write a lot of spiritual poetry actually. And I I sort of, first I was- Spiritual, wow, wow. Uh, I, I, uh, you don't know, we, we do have, we do have huge interest in spirituality <laughs> because our music, the music that we promote connects uh, spirituality, but that spirituality, uh, perhaps our own interpretation of spirituality. I'm an agnostic man, but I still, uh, when the word comes to me, uh, I still have, I still can connect something that uh, people from theological background do as well. Sometimes I feel careful when I listen to music. Uh, when we uh, go back to your spiritual points, is it possible uh, briefly to share your, your own interpretation of spirituality? Well, I believe that um, for me, God is God. A spiritual, spiritual is a presence. It's God is a presence um, mm -hmm. in, in the way I can describe it. And I believe that there is no difference. To me, I don't believe in the difference in religions because I believe that if people are coming from one point of focus, that is where misunderstandings mm -hmm. occur. I believe we're all the same and we, somebody, I know that some people believe, don't believe they're what do you call it, atheists. I understand that. I totally do, and that's they're free to have that choice. I don't sit there. I'm I'm very open to spirituality. I'm open to different religions. Open to different me methodologies and things like that. I'm not bothered to do a hand with, with wanting to be a unicorn with a dot all over the head. It's fine. <laughs> okay, fair enough. That's your choice. But because I'm not going to judge you, that's fine. We we were all we born to respect to each other that's the way i see it whether they follow a faith or not and we're all people end up there you know we're all the same we're all people end up there there's only one world and you know wherever you go you'll meet people i've been traveling quite a bit different places and um i think when you start talking about religion and you start bringing that up that's when people get into difficulty and it creates problems but end of mm. day you know people need to just re recognize that we're all people end up there that's th that's the biggest thing for me mm. Not than anything else. So I can't explain everything else in that. I just that's how I feel. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's hard. It's not easy. Mm -hmm. uh, this one is it's a small poem. It's called Silence. Mm -hmm. I am approaching silence. Only hearing birdsong, speaking in a language of light that harmonizes beautifully in my soul. Fractures of light dance across the skies, leaving soft footprints to follow. I can see no clouds, just shades of a dawn that is just about to break, in glistening shades of yellows, pinks and blues. No words are needed for the sight that greets my eyes, just a moment of a dawning, bringing me closer to a depth of silence, 
which has no echoes, just a faint whisper of just listen. So there's that one. Hmm. And this, I, this one is called, um, um, this one called I am peaceful in the green. I am peaceful in the green. It reminds me of the Waltons, being free, surrounded by nature, raw and wild. It attracts the animus in me. As I shift and change into a wilder woman, sparking a recall of a soul connection, once lost in a lifetime that has gone by. I sit and watch the wind as it breezes through the trees, beckoning to me, speaking in a language I can read and hear. Come fly with me, watch as I swoop through the branches and play with the clouds, spoken laughingly in a voice that sparkles like honeydew. I watch as the soft wisps weave around me, whispering sweet words or flights of fancy. My eyes can see and I can feel it in my heart, and I can feel the sacredness of the words in my soul. My heart journeys on a different path, towards the green, the ever-flowing life force of the universe that gives birth, dies and is reborn. I too am budding like a seed in growth, giving life to green shoots of my own, which reconnects me to Lady Gaia, the Lady Goddess, who beckons me deeply into the green. I move, I grow, I change, I sow, and then I become the green. The green calls to me as I am peaceful in the green. Do you want one more? <laughs> I've got, this one is called Soul Recall. The sands of time pass by, day after day, year after year, era after era. But I have still found you in this lifetime. I recognize you and you recognize me. We are part of the same soul tribe. We can communicate without a voice. It is a knowing deep inside. Our thoughts and feelings will speak in volumes instead of words. I know it and so do you. It is scary waking up to this world. I know it more than you. When a soul can communicate directly, a body is not needed. Just an inner vision that moves in ways that don't need to speak. If you dare to look inside without fear, listen to that inner voice that calls you as it isn't an illusion. Just thoughts and feelings from times gone by of memories that are bringing a soul recall of our lives entwined of times past and present. All you need to do is remember. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Shivan. Sorry, thank you, Musarat. Uh, one thing perhaps, uh, uh, I mean, um, I would like to ask you now, uh, how the how did themes come to you when you especially when you write poetry? I I work a lot with people. The people I communities that I work with are from all across the world. Mm. And mm. They, my, the group I work with is called Biosat. It means Bradford Immigration and Stamp Seeker Support Network. And literally it is like a world hub. We've got people from all over the world, Iran, Iraq, Pakistan, India, Afghanistan, Korea, China, you name it. And we sit there, we talk, we talk about religion, we talk about culture. And for, as my own culture, I was brought up with in a South Asian community. So the roots of having a heritage is, is something I take from regularly. But when we move into the different worlds, we start working across um, different, we come across different communities and different realities, I suppose. And I started exploring what it means, what is the meaning of life, I suppose, and what does spirituality mean? because uh, being brought up with a faith, it was, you have, you sometimes, you think like this, and when I started talking to other people, mm -hmm. I, it started opening my mind mentally, and then I just thought, you know what, I need to find what is mm -hmm. important for me, and what makes me tick, and what are the things I'm interested in. For me, I, I'm not bothered mm -hmm. about religion, because I don't, I don't believe in religion is the thing that ties us together, I believe that we are people, and that ties us together. So for me, mm -hmm. it was, finding these relationships with people and then we'd, we'd have conversations and sometimes they become very deep and sometimes they become very you know intricate so and also mm. because a lot of the projects that I do I run a lot of residential day trips we go into the countryside um, and people from the communities that we work with are brought up in uh, rural communities and they love going out to the Yorkshire Dales 
So that was something that was inspiring me as well. So I've spent a lot of time in the countryside with people taking them out on these trips. So it was just finding the beauty of things and about what's happening in the community when you're trying to build understanding about what is important to other cultures and communities, particularly into a Western, into a Western world. If so, I'm not trying to, you know, say that ignorant, I'm not saying that at all. I'm saying is that sometimes there's cultural misunderstandings, which are sometimes mm. people don't realize are affecting people and we're trying to raise awareness about these issues. So I find that I'm, I'm, because I'm moving around and talking to people, I find themes where I where I see mm. what's happening in the community and with mm. my environment. That inspires me. Uh, I know you mentioned uh, uh, some great Persian poets who inspired you a lot. Uh, Rumi, Hafiz, for example. Is there any contemporary poetry poets that uh, you read with that level of interest? Uh, Say that again. Uh, remember you mentioned uh, Rumi, Hafiz, some um, uh, great Persian poets yeah. have inspired your, you know, your poetry, especially yeah. when you write spiritual poems. Uh, any contemporary poets who you write, you read with similar interest? Well, to be honest, it's, I haven't actually read a lot. What I've done is I've actually, because I've been moving into arts and cultural circles, I've met so many people. Uh, yeah. The one, one that's been to mind is I met Imran Qureshi, who who's and his um, one of the um, he does artwork. He creates artwork based on uh, Fares Ali Fares, a poet from Pakistan. Ah, great poet, great yeah, socialist poet, poet. So equally spiritual. My favorite poet. Yes, I met his. Uh, I met years ago. I met his daughter Salima Hashmi, and I yeah. didn't know. Yeah, in Bradford. Yeah, they came to Bradford, they did a project. It was um, a women artist of Pakistan. And I actually okay. met another lady called Bajan Hunjan, who I'm still in touch with, who was an artist, contemporary artist. And that's how I got to know about uh, her. I didn't realize it was her dad, actually. Um, I have moved around and met different poets and I've talked to him, but I couldn't tell you off the top of my head. But the reason why I remember it is because I actually got to work with Imran Qureshi a couple of years ago. We would mm -hmm. be actually um, from the community. We were working on a project about what modern uh, modern day conflict um it was about world war one he specifically creates artistic responses to world war one and world war two from what i'm aware of and things that have happened around the world you know to death i suppose um so he came to bradford and we didn't know at the time but they um so we were we came in from the refugee and asylum seeker community mm. and we had to create artwork in response to one of the themes now the theme was modern day conflict and i was a bit aware because i thought oh my god i've got to take this back to the group and i hope they, they don't mm. actually you know have a, a really bad reaction so mm. we tried to um, so what i learned from that experience was that it was very cathartic we made some beautiful mm. canvases that were an exhibit at the cartwright hall but at the same time they i realized that in the group within the group we had a lot of closet poets who wrote a lot of poetry and since then we've tried to get on platforms and we did manage with one of the it was Bradford Literature Festival gave us an opportunity where we got some of our poets out that was from that point moving on forwards it was a couple of years later that happened but it made me realize it also pushed me back into my poetry as well I thought if if opportunities don't come to me I will make them so I decided to go out and actively find places where we could raise a profile of our community and works that are interested uh, to us as artists and individuals. Because I think it get, it's got to the point where people, it's people who are looking for these opportunities, not mm -hmm. more and more people are coming back to writing artists. There's so many more artists and poets now than there used to be mm -hmm. them before. Thank you. Thank you, Musarab. Uh, many thanks. Uh, uh, I would like to uh, see some of your artworks next time I come back to you. Okay. Uh, uh, we are trying to connect uh, Roberto. Uh, for some reasons, this is quite, uh, his internet is not working and then I keep uh, sending a message and that is not being seen. Uh, very unfortunate scenario. Uh, one of the finest poets of all of you, I read some of his poems and that is so uh, subtle, Poetically exuberant, and there are so many books actually published on his poetry, and uh, I was interested into 
uh, finding more on Uruguayan poetry. So we know about Latin American literature and poetry as a whole, but uh, there are some interesting exploration perhaps uh, could happen from, could, could come, come out from uh, Roberto. Let's see whether Roberto is, I'm just gonna send another message. Uh, unfortunately, that is not being seen anyway. Uh, uh, Shivan, I asked you a very, very, perhaps a very difficult question. Uh, and that is a, a question to philosophers, not a poet, uh, not to a poet. Idea about truth. Truth is so highly, exclusively, uh, extensively discussed word by philosophers of different ages. Um, and uh, they, they have their own interpretation, their own takes on truth, many logics, uh, and many, many discourses uh, on the on just a word, truth. Uh, but because I asked, uh, well, I would like to know uh, a poet's interpretation of not philosophers, perhaps a poet has their own construction of uh, ideas, their own construction, their own ideas about truth. Even Tagore, uh, I, well, I asked you, Rabindranath Tagore, uh, has said something very interesting uh, on on the word truth. Uh, he said uh, a, ge a geographical place, perhaps, uh, or a historical place, we know as a truth. Ramer John Mustan, Udutar Cheo Shotro, you know, from his Kobo Monobum. A poet's mind is even more, a uh, bear's uh, poet's mind even bear more truth than what we knew as truth for many years uh, that Ojutta is the birthplace of Ram. So uh, this is, this was, this seemed as uh, truth. Ojutta is the, a, a place where Ram was born. But even, uh, I mean, uh, even a poet's mind, whatever comes in poet's mind, it might not have any logic. It might be seen as not truthful from other people's point of view. But a poet's mind uh, uh, is uh, does bear more truth than uh, what we know as as gospel truth or something. So that's why I, I was uh, uh, I, I was tempted to ask you what what is your own interpretation uh, about truth, Shivan? Wow, well, that's a question, isn't it? Um, I know. I think. Um, when I say truth, it seems to be a word that it, it keeps coming to me at the moment. And I think it's, I think what we attempt to do as poets is, in Ireland, they talk about um, the veil, the veils parting between the worlds. Mm -hmm. And that's just one way I think of, or you could call it the conscious and the unconscious, or you could call it the profane and the sacred. There's many ways of, of mm -hmm. talking about it, aren't there? But mm -hmm. for me, I think it's a moment when your rational um, ego thinking mind goes quiet and suddenly you see the, the reality or the truth of the greater um, mm -hmm. beingness beneath everything else and you have a moment of it and I think that can translate into a, into a million different ways and I think as poets trying to kind of show the invisible truth by wrapping our words around something that you can't ever see but you may mm. have moments of experiencing and it's mm. something it's like it's something underneath everything that we are this mm. truth so you, you i suppose somebody else might call that god or consciousness or mm. whatever so that's i suppose what i'm saying and i think it takes i think writing poetry i think you have to be courageous Mm -hmm. Because you have to listen to your own truth and mm -hmm. um, and and try and express it, um, mm -hmm. and 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 try not to be afraid of 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 that. I think I think courage and truth kind of go together. Let us listen more. Fine. Oh, another poem. Um, yeah. Okay, I'll do. Um, I will do. I'm going to do a little one, and it's. Um, I'm really enjoying your poetry, Musarat. Uh, uh, so this is this is a tiny little one, um, but it kind of talks about voice as well, or or, or listen, listening. So, um, listen, 
The whole world is calling out to you, pouring its crazy music through the holy temple of your own body. Listen, you know the tune, rise up, set out, we know the way home. So I suppose, I think we do know the way home. We just get, <laughs> get clouded over by all the kind of structures and things. I think we do in ourselves, yes. in our deep selves, know the way home. Mm. Hey, uh, Robert, uh, well, unfortunately, we missed him, Shivan. He's such an interesting man. I mean, oh, sure. a, a good combination of, a good combination of, uh, a poetic excellence and all, I mean, he's, he's such an excellent poet and also such an excellent academician. Uh, he uh, propagates the uh, I mean, he preaches about Uruguayan poetry in different universities, Oxford, um, Germ I mean, some universities in Germany, especially in Europe. And again, uh, uh, he translated uh, many great works of Uruguayan poets uh, and some extent, uh, some other uh, Latin American uh, writers as well. Uh, ta, ta, ta. So that would be a great bliss for our audiences and for myself as well, just to explore. Unfortunately, unfortunately we missed him. Uh, we lost him. Uh, ta, ta, ta. Sent him two messages to see if he comes back. Right, Musarat, uh, what is, uh, I mean, did you manage to find out some some of your artworks? Yes. Uh, let's see. Let's see. So I've been creating um, in response to obviously the lockdown, COVID-19. I've been playing around with the themes of urban, nature, funky, um, spirituality, weaving them together using copper wire. So, and also because I was playing around with the in some of the communities, traditional communities that wear face veils. So I tried, I created this. So it's uh, it's meant to be upcycled, a bit posh and uh, funkified. So it's like uh, a jazzy blingy blinged up. <laughs> As you've seen in some of the African countries, what they've done is do some proper blingy face masks, which I think are awesome. <laughs> so I mean, this is one of my creations. Mm -hmm. So I know it looks a little bit odd. And then I've been working on the nature theme. So I've been, this is another one that I made. I've made quite a few, so I've only pulled out some of them. So this is just it, like sculptural pieces. So mm -hmm. it's like meant to be um, ethereal type fantasy weaving them together so that's one of the other ones that I created mm. so I know it's probably you're probably thinking okay <laughs> no 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 but uh, also uh, what you said before that you tried to transmit word into culture is that what you yeah 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 that, that's true. I've got I've got about 30 maybe about up to 30 pieces so it's pulling them out is what I can actually hold so in response to the news, in the fact that we were kept having so many changes from the government in regards to COVID-19, this is called the crown of, crown of, new, of news, but it's using keywords and creating uh, a responses like, um, is, so some of the keywords have actually put into the, worded into this side, but it's like a jester's hat in a sense. This, what, this is what it feels like, a jester's hat. Because you can't keep keep track of the government and some things are saying. So uh, I'll keep cutting out keywords about safety, you know, little things, truth lies, or those things to, about what we're doing and how we feel in this in at the moment in society. So I've been it's been play on words and play on themes. That's what mm -hmm. it's been. Mm -hmm. so. Thank you, thank you, thank you very much, Musarat. Uh, uh, let us have your last poem okay. and then I'll come back to Shivan for your last poem as well. Okay. Okay, I'm gonna do a small one actually. Mm -hmm. It's not very big. Um it's mm -hmm. it is about COVID. It's called Storm Before the Quiet. An eerie silence greets me as I walk along the streets. My footsteps echo an awareness of my arrival in a land once trodden in multiplicity. I hear the strange voices of passerbys tainted by the silent world in which we have arrived, 
Roads which once were heaving, car to car, bus to trucks, now hummed quietly with a screech of passing cars. People now disappeared into shades of quiet, sharing space in the human building blocks, occasionally set loose to forage. In, once was what, in what was once a lifestyle, but now limited, two by two we are let out of our cages to explore the urban jungle. The sights and sounds of nature penetrate all of existence. In a limited world which was once unlimited, our reality has diluted down existence to its core of fundamental being in the existence of I am. That's thank it. You. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, before we go back to Shivan, another question, uh, Monserrat, do you, uh, while you were reading poetry, uh, I was thinking whether you experienced ever uh, a situation where you tried to express certain things, and then you then you started writing poetry as a you know as a form to express, and you you couldn't even express it. You didn't define, or you couldn't uh, uh, you could. I mean, the the, the way you uh, are feeling your emotion, you couldn't even express, and then you tried with the other form of arts, but. Uh, you tried, but you didn't. Ex you didn't express in a way you want. Have you do you experience that? I did uh, actually. Poetry? I used to write a lot of poetry. Believe it or not, I was uh, my. I've always been in the arts, poetry, drama, mm -hmm. on all those things since I was a child. And um, for some reason, when I got to eighteen, I stopped writing. Mm -hmm. I don't even know what happened to put me to this point where I stopped writing, and mm -hmm. my writing was. Uh, I used to write, I used to, believe it or not, I used to write and win a lot of poetry competitions. Mm -hmm. And then I stopped writing, I don't know what happened to me, and then I ended up back into the arts, trying all sorts of different art forms, and then I did come back into my, um, it was one particular experience that I had that I felt it shut me down, and then I went straight back into, after that, it took me a little bit of time to find myself again I suppose and then I went back into writing again and it's taken me I'd say really about 18 months to hone my writing to make my writing legible and flow is the right word it doesn't happen overnight I don't think I think it takes time I think when you start writing as well believe me I've wrote some some stuff and I'm like did I really write that it's sometimes some of the things I've wrote doesn't make sense and I'm like okay so I leave it I keep it, I leave it, and then I look at it, seeing if I can take anything from that, rehash it, and shape it again. That's what I do. Mm -hmm. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, Shivan. One of uh, our uh, friends who texted me that your interpretation of uh, truth was intriguing, because obviously truth is a subject. Uh, the uh, philosophers of classical age, that include Plato, uh, Socrates, the two, hours after hours, especially Plato's dialogue, uh, is mostly about the idea of truth. But uh, is, she said, uh, uh, what a beautiful uh, interpretation of, poetic interpretation of truth, anyway. Uh, let me see, let me see if there is any other comment. Uh, 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 we can see there are some enjoying poetical moments. That's my Joel Mazhar, Orjun Rai, Shubhacha Ruilo, Mike O'Leary. Uh, I'm enjoying your words as they dance across my screen. Many thanks, Mike, for watching. Uh, thank you. Uh, we are coming back to uh, Shivan for her last poem. Uh, but before you read your poem, Shivan, uh, the same question to you as well, because sometimes I feel that phase, uh, not sometimes, very often, that I try to express, say for instance, if I'm depressed for anything, uh, sometimes when I'm lonely, uh, some schizophrenic uh, moments or scene I, I try to depict through uh, poetry. And then I, I think I feel sort of I am hugely failed even by not going to near 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 to what I what I try to write. 
do you did you ever experience that phase or that level of failure of expressing uh, your emotions all the time all the time <laughs> yes it's mm. like yeah trying to put this into words it's like mm. i mean i've been writing for oh, i don't know 25 years or whatever and i think it's yeah it, it's you're always honing your craft so it's, i think it's a bit i always think it's a bit like being a you know if you were um like a a sculptor or something you know mm. it's like um try you have to be so skilled so that you can try and create what you want to create mm. and, and 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 yes i fail all the time and sometimes we catch a glimpse of what we're trying to say don't we and that's beautiful so we keep on at it don't we trying to catch those glimpses mm. thank you Shivan. many 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 thanks uh, uh, for uh, joining and uh, contributing with your ideas. Uh, that is definitely a bliss for our audiences and for myself, for sure. Uh, let us listen to your last point. Well, thank you. It's been a, an absolute pleasure again. Um, so this is a poem called Opening Prayer. Um, and the, the her or the she in it at the end is what I would call this, the sacred or the divine feminine, that balance of the sacred masculine and feminine. So it's called Opening Prayer. We will begin again to trust the sound of the sea calling us, feel a ripple of response, the answering cry of our soul's body echo through us like a prayer. We will begin again to breathe in rhythm with the earth, moving beneath our feet, moaning in her ecstasy, a psalm written in the body of our souls, and we will remember the opening prayer of this birth moving through us like a dark river in a line ancient and unbroken spanning the oceans of time. And we will know her here with us, dancing to the same beat on the same shore, dark currents pulling us home. Dark currents pulling us home. Many, many, many thanks, Shivan. Thank you. Many, many thanks, Musharat, Thank uh, for joining us today. And uh, thanks to all of our audiences who watched, who shared. An apology uh, to the audiences um, for not being able to feature uh, Roberto's talk and poetry. All of a sudden, uh, he was disconnected and he was disconnected fully from internet, uh, even uh, we tried to contact, uh, but we, you know, we, could, we, 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 we were not successful in contacting him. So many thanks again, and see you soon again with some other wonderful poets uh, uh, while you are self-isolating. And I'm sure art form, uh, this uh, beautiful portrayal of arts, literature, music is is giving you uh, redemption, uh, giving you your own space to focus on. Uh, and many thanks who left uh, uh, wonderful feedback, wonderful comments, and um, who shared uh, this link and managed uh, to, uh, I mean, um, gave the opportunity for others to be the part of this uh, session. Thanks again, and see you soon again thank you. Uh, thank you stay home stay safe thank you thank you, thank you. Uh,